go ahead and um okay um i'm gonna go ahead and share Great having you here doctor oh thank you i'll go ahead and share my screen real quick um yeah i just we just went over this okay here we go share screen okay we good to go we are good to go hey with all the stress we're dealing with we are good to go <laughs> well, now to you to help us feel a little better the floor is okay. yours <laughs> okay, again, my name is Vincent Walford. I'm one of the staff psychologists uh, here at, at CAPS. Um, pleasure to be here. I'm fairly new. Um, I just got here and I started in January. And so I just kind of got acclimated to coming back to in person in August. So um, still kind of new, still trying to figure out the parking situation where I'm not paying $16 to $20 a day. But um, I've been getting in a lot of steps because I park in the in the neighborhood and just brought my family. So, um, so again, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I feel like I'm with family. Um, and uh, as far as somebody who does presentations all the time, when I'm around family, I feel a lot more comfortable. Um, and I appreciate that experience. So, before we get started, I love doing a mood check, right? So, if you could say in the chat box. On a scale of one to 10, one feeling horrible, 10 feeling best, where are you at today? And give me a word to describe it. So right now I'm teetering around a seven or an eight, but I'm I'm pretty exhausted. So I just kind of want to see like where um where some of um hold on a second. Where some of our uh okay, some okay, so Darren is a seven. Um Anybody else feel comfortable sharing kind of where they are at today? Got a couple in there. Colleen is a six. Okay. Sam is a three. Okay. Oh, okay. So Stephen is a seven. Uh, Catherine is an eight. Um, Tasha is a five. April is a five. Okay. So, so, we got a so four we're in there. we got um, a Mario's a four. So we got some, so this is, this presentation will be very timely, right? Because we're going to talk about what we've been going through. We're going to talk about stress. We're also going to talk about burnout. We're also going to talk about the need for self-care, okay? So let's talk about stresses during the pandemic. So what do we know? So for the last year and some change, um, almost going on two years, um, we've been in the space of a pandemic, right? And so um, I don't know about y'all, but I could have never imagined that um, COVID-19 or the coronavirus would be this big and this huge and affect all of us in so many ways. So as we're starting to come back in person and as we're starting, um, you know, as we're ending 2021, I want to talk about some of the things that may have continued to be a stressor for us. So for one, for one we have experienced various types of loss whether it be loss of, of loved ones, family members, friends, colleagues. Um, some people have experienced loss, losses of jobs. Um, I work with a lot of students who talk about preparation for graduation and kind of this loss of innocence around the fact that there may be, um, they may not have a graduation to look for, forward to or you know those type of things. Um, I know there's individuals who say, you know, I've just kind of lost hope in a lot of things. So we have experienced a lot of uh, different forms of loss. A lot of individuals have been struggling with um, social, social isolation and struggles with self-care. So we'll talk a little bit more about self-care and why that's important, but the social isolation is huge for a lot of people, right? There's a lot of individuals who are saying, you know what, since this pandemic, I haven't gone out. I don't trust uh, the communities. I don't trust coming back to work. You know, um, these masks are confining or, you know, some individuals may say, well, I'm upset that people aren't wanting to wear masks. So there's a lot of a lot of talk around uh, social isolation and what that has done for a lot of people. Um, again, working with students here, a lot of individuals who are now having to come back in person have even talked to me and said, hey, you know what, Vincent, um, I'm learning how to, you know, be social again. And so I'm, I know if, if, if our students are going through it, some of us are going through it. It could be a lot. Also, managing physical and mental health conditions and/or history of trauma. Uh, you know, this pandemic is 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 a beast in itself, and it, it's it's very uh, anxiety provoking in itself. But if you are somebody 
who has been struggling with mental health issues, or if you're somebody who's been str struggling with different health issues or struggling with trauma, you know, this, the impact of the pandemic can really increase your anxiety around that or depression. Um, navigating this virtual world. I love, I feed off of people. I love doing presentations in front of people. So even doing this or even doing different um, presentations has been very, very different for me just because now most of the things that I do are virtual. And I'm not gonna lie, I feel a lot more stressed now that some of our student groups are asking us to do things in person. Cause now I have to then, um, uh, 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 there's a conflict around, well, do I feel like they'll be, will I be safe? Will they all be wearing masks? What, do I need to wear a mask? Do I feel comfortable wearing a mask? Um, just this whole navigation about virtual world has been a lot for people. And we also have um, been dealing with a lot of racism. And, 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 and since I'm talking to my family, I feel like we can be real with each other. We've been dealing with racism probably most of our lives, right? But I do think now through this pandemic that there's, a, there's been a lot of, um, uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of um, presentations or um, a lot of news fair or news activity around racism, racism and xenophobia and what that looks like for our, our country. And we also have financial concerns, right? Some, some individuals have lost jobs. Some people have had a, have pay cuts. Um, you know, I'm glad that we're all here and I'm glad that we all have a job, but we may have partners who are struggling financially, we may have friends, we may have family, all these things can kind of um, continue to uh, clump up and, to, and help us increase our, or not help us, but increase our anxiety. We also have concerns about access to healthcare and adequate safety. I think about this big, big topic about whether to get vaccinated, whether not to get vaccinated, right? Um, now that some of these areas um, are, are allowing you know, the lacks of um, uh, mask usage, you know, now more people are getting common colds and getting the flu and things like that, where we once were more protected because we were actively wearing um, masks. And so through all that, through all those stressors and through our, during the pandemic and through all the stresses that we may be walking in just to doing our job, this can lead to what we call burnout, right? And so I was telling Darren um, earlier that I needed to put this in, 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 in my presentation. The reason why I feel like I wanted to put this in my presentation is because I'm there, I'm feeling it, right? It is October 12th and we have been just loaded with students. Um, and I, I love what I do, I love what I do, but I'm not gonna lie, I am drowning in work, which I'm sure a lot of individuals are too. So I wanted to, us to talk about burnout and what it looks like, okay? So just a quick uh, brief definition, uh, burnout is a state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. So if we think about the things we just I just talked about as far as some of the stresses we've been dealing with for almost two years now, plus what other stresses may be at your home or in your personal life, plus um, our, our work stress, that's a lot of stress, right? And that stress combined together can lead to burnout. And now let's look at what is the difference between stress and burnout, right? So when we think about stress, we think about over-engagement, right? So stress can make you feel like you can't put your phone down. You always have to be connected to your job, right? Because if you don't, then things will fall out of order, okay? But burnout will make you feel like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to do my work, right? I want to just step away from the job because it's caused me so much anxiety. I just can't deal with it anymore. Um, uh, stress can cause a loss of energy, right? Well, you are doing so much work. You're putting so much into your work that you just have no energy at all. I think about, um, I, again, I was, uh, Darren has been such a great, um, a, new, a, new, a new colleague slash friend of mine. I was talking to him this weekend. And when I started this presentation, he said, no, wait a minute. Now, what, what days do you get off this week? And I said, I've worked six, over the last week, I've worked six days, and I'm probably going to be working six days this week. And so when I get home, y'all, I am exhausted, right? But burnout will make you lose motivation and hope that the system will get better, that your work will get better. You start to then question, 
and what I am and what am I what am I doing at this job? Am I being productive? Are the students who I'm working with, are they really getting the best of me? Okay. And as we know, stress can oftentimes lead to anxiety, right? This constant fear of, am I doing enough? Whereas burnout can make you lead to depression and make you really feel sad and down and, and the lack of the motivation and hope of just even coming to work, okay? And, um, and again, the, the primary damage for stress, a lot of times is physical because we internalize it. Our body gets, gets so worn out that we either start getting sick, we start getting headaches, we start getting rashes. You know, there's a lot of things that stress uh, can do to our body. Whereas burnout is more emotional damage, right? So that's where we just feel like, you know what? Every time I go to work, I just don't feel productive and I don't even want to be there, okay? So that's the, these are some of the main differences between stress and burnout. So let's talk about what can cause burnout, okay? So these are just a few things that may cause some burnout with any job, okay? So sometimes there is a mismatch between the nature of a person and the nature of the job, right? So sometimes we may come into a position thinking, oh, okay, you know, this is the best fit for me. And through whatever reason, whether it be the, the job title change, whether it be um, uh, new administration, whatever, there may just be a mismatch, right? And so now you're coming to a position that you feel like I'm just not a good fit anymore, okay? Um, lack of recognition. You know, one of the things that when I, when I work with people, uh, whether it be um, in a setting like this where we're doing presentations or uh, whether I'm leading some type of committee, I always wanna give people their flowers, right? People, we love to be recognized, not just because we wanna be put on show, but we want for people to realize hey, I appreciate what you're doing. You know, I appreciate that you're going above and beyond, right? Above and beyond the job that you're supposed to do, and especially in academia. Because a lot of times when we're working with students, some of us can feel, you know, this is a thankless position. You know, I'm staying up at night, making sure our students have all the resources they can, but nobody's really taking care of me, okay? Um, caregiver issues. So this may be things at home. Um, uh, you may have uh, other roles and responsibilities outside of, of job, of, of your job that may be causing you stress. Um, I know I've worked with some people, um, some of my colleagues who say, you know, my stress ain't at work, my stress is at home and all the other different roles and responsibilities I have there. Um, hours and work demands, you know, again, I don't think any of us, if I could pull um, everybody that's working here and say, do you really put just eight hours in a day? I'm sure all of us could probably say, nah, I go above and beyond that. And, and I, I commend you for that, but I also think that this is where we need to start working on boundaries and what that looks like, okay? Um, just a lack of control. Um, you know, sometimes there's just so many things that we're trying to do within our job that we don't realize that there's not a lot of control that we can do, right? And so we can be spinning our wheels and thinking we're doing the best we can, but then some, our administration or somebody, a boss, a supervisor, or maybe even a colleague can say, ah, yeah, but Vincent, that, that's not enough, okay? And um, just a conflict of value. And so, you know, um, you know, maybe what you deem to be valuable or, or think about um, what, the moral, what your morals say, may be totally different than what the organization says, or maybe even your supervisor. I think a good example of this is, is uh, and for our field, is clinical care, right? You know, a lot of us are taught, you know, specific ways or, or various ways to work with students, um, but we learn those ways and we feel like they're valuable and can be really be helpful and supportive for our students, but that may go against what the administrator says, our administrative um, views are, or what's really important for our students, okay? So all these things can cause burnout, right? So there also may be life issues that cause burnout, okay? And as I'm going through these things, I want you to think about your own life, right? I want you to think about how you're managing some of these different areas that may cause you burnout, right? Um, lack of balance of fun and pleasure and activities. Again, we're gonna talk about at the end self-care and what that looks like. Um, lack of a support system. Um, you know, I think that that is huge too. You know, we're in, we're in 
um, uh, student student health or student care or, or, or working with students. And a lot of times we pour so much into our students that oftentimes we don't sit back and say, it's, who's pouring into me? You know, who's making sure I'm being edified? Who's giving me compliments or who's holding me accountable for certain things, right? And that's where we get that from our support system. So if you lack that support, that could also lead to burnout. Um, lack of sleep. And I, 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 I've worked with some of my colleagues at different institutions. And every time we talk to each other, a lot of times when we talk to each other, we say, oh, hey, hey Bobby Joe, how are you feeling? Or, hey, Vincent, how are you feeling? First thing we say, oh, I'm tired. I'm tired. And a lot of times we're not getting enough sleep. We're not getting enough sleep to let our brain rest as we continue to engage with a lot of difficulties we may get engaged in with working with some of our students. Now, these are some of the physical symptoms that can be seen of, 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 um, of uh, um, burnout, right? So fatigue and tired, like I said, um, frequent headaches, back pain, and muscle aches, right? All these are physical forms of, of burnout. Um, change in appetite, change in sleep. Maybe you're not sleeping enough or maybe you're sleeping too much, right? And so finally, we have kind of these emotional symptoms. So again, a loss of motivation, not feeling motivated to go to work, not feeling like what you're doing with the students or what you're doing in your admin roles is really doing, doing any, any benefit to, to your job. Um, feeling detached, feeling detached and just feeling like, ah, this is just somewhere I'm going to get a check. Um, that hopelessness is huge because hopelessness is huge in depression, right? So when you, we talk to a lot of our students or just even individuals I've worked with in the past, um, and you say, well, how would you describe your depression? And when they say, I feel hopeless, to a lot of them that means I see no future. I see no type of hope. I see no way to get out of this situation. And if you're in a position here at Penn or in any position, whether you're in, you know, in your personal life or your, your work life, you know, that can definitely be the core of your symptoms of um, burnout. And then just feeling trapped, feeling like there's no way out of the system, okay? And then some here, some behavior symptoms. Um, one of the biggest things that people use as a coping mechanism that we don't talk about, we talk about drugs, we talk about alcohol, of course, but one thing we don't talk about is food. And oftentimes food can be abused. One, it's rarely available. Two, I mean, let's be honest, it makes us feel good. Um, um, but three, a lot of times our body, when we're in these stressful moments, we're, we're, we're craving for carbs. You know, I tell people, I joke all the time about, you know, how I had to kind of, you know, check myself. Um, when, I was in, um, when I was in my last um, uh, year of getting my PhD um, at Howard, if you've been on Howard's campus, there's a, a McDonald's right across the street. And I'd be at work, at work and school and just so stressed. And I'd, I'd come out that campus and I see them golden arches to the side. And I said, ooh, and I, you know, in grad school, I ain't had no money. Um, but I said, man, I had to stop over there and get me a, 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 a dollar burger. That would definitely make me feel good. And it was almost like, to me, like smoking a cigarette or doing something, the, the craving of it. And once I got that burger, it just um, satisfied me. And I was like, ah. But as I know, that's not healthy for me, right? Um, another thing is um, angry outbursts or snapping. If you see that you are in positions at work or in your personal life or even some of your community activism things, and you start to feel like you're, you're losing control or snapping at people, again, this would be a form of, of burnout or just being overly stressed, okay? So now, so when I think about all of that, when I think about stress, when I think about uh, burnout, when I think about all the things we've been through, I think about the three P's of how to support mental health, right? Number one, be proactive. Two, connect with other people. And three, seek professional support, okay? So one, be a pro proactive. That means you are the best assessor of what is going on for you, right? So if you feel like you're being burned out, if you feel like you're being stressed with work, you know, this is your time to take control of that and seek the, the different uh, resources or help that you need, right? Second P is connect with other people. A lot of times when we're stressed, a lot of times we're feeling overwhelmed or burnt out, we want to disconnect from people. We don't want to be around people. 
right? We want to just deal with whatever we're going through by ourselves. But as we know, connection with people, good people, your support system is very important because they can, they can continue to pour into you. They can sometimes see things that you can't see, right? And so, or hold you accountable for maybe some of your, your personal uh, goals of, of just getting out of this rut or this, or this, um, this bad space that you're in, okay? And then finally, of course, seek professional support and we'll go over what that looks like. So now let's talk about self-care real quick, right? So before we get into it, I just wanna talk about what self-care, like the myths of self-care. And so one of the things that we've talked to people about, you know, over a span of years is that there are pretty, there's a lot of myths of self-care, of self but these are some of the main ones. One is that self-care is selfish. And I think that we live in a space because we're all givers, right? I, I don't think I've met anybody who is in academia who does not want to give to people, right? So a lot of times, we'll, you know, people will say, well, you know, I give so much. I feel like if I take a little time for myself, that's selfish. But one of the things that I learned when I was at Morehouse School of Medicine, getting my, uh, my first class in my public health program, is our professor said, you can give 100% of yourself if you're working at 60% or at 50% or at 40%, right? In order for you to be able to give to yourself, you have to be at, at, at 100% to be the best you, okay? And a lot of times that involves self-care. Um, second, self-care is one more thing I have, to, uh, I have to do. When I've worked with people around uh, developing different forms of self-care, you know, I tell them, wait, 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 we, we get into the weeds of things. You know, you're, you're, you're over, you're over generalizing are you becoming anxious about self-care this is something that's supposed to be fun this is something that's supposed to put you in a better place than where you're at okay and the last thing is that there is a right way to do self-care now if i ask people so what do you think is the right way to do self-care i'm sure a lot of people will say self-care is going to uh, a spa or you know getting massages or getting your uh, a manicure and a pedicure or whatever some of these stereotypes of of what self-care is, is. Um, but I want us to talk about some different ways of self-care, okay? So one of the things, um, so self-care can be a lot of things. So self-care can be one, asking for help. And I know a lot of people are, are probably thinking to themselves, well, how can self-care be asking for help? Well, if you are struggling and in a bad space, asking for help is saying, hey, I need help. I need somebody to support me. I need somebody to pour into me, okay? Um, spending time alone and not and not isolating from people, but I know for me, I'm an extrovert person, right? I'm around people all the time, but in order for me to refuel myself, I have to be alone. I have to, you know, you know watch a good uh, Netflix show or read a book or, or, or meditate in, in prayer time or whatever it is so I can use that time to recharge myself. Putting yourself first. Like I said earlier, a lot of times we put so much stuff in front of us that we forget that, you know what, I need to take care of me too. Um, asking for what you need, setting boundaries. I wish I could, if I was in front of everybody right now, I would say, how many of us struggle with setting boundaries? And, I, and I'm sure a lot of people would raise their hand. Setting boundaries is important because what it does is it lets other people know, hey, I'm taking, I want to take care of myself, right? I want to make sure I'm in the space to be my best self. And, but in order for me to do that, I have to, I have to set firm boundaries. Um, staying at home, saying no, right? And I think that's another one I would ask. Like, how many people here struggle to say no? And I know I was raising my hand to the, to the fullest. I, I struggle with that still. Um, you know, some of my colleagues, we all, we all struggle with saying no, but saying no is also part of setting those good boundaries. Forgiving yourself. A lot of times we do things, we make mistakes, and we're so hard on ourselves that we forget that, hey, we're people too. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. So working on forgiving yourself is a form of self-care. Um, sometimes just taking a step back, um, you know, reviewing everything, assessing the situation um, is also a form of self-care. So let's now talk about different um, strategies um, that we can do um, as an individual and that you can do with the group as far as self-care. So again, thinking about, um, think, let's go back to what I asked, I mean, uh, 
about what I talked about at the very beginning when I said, I want you to think about these forms are these what we call symptoms of burnout or just stress in general and see, you know, how are you been dealing with them, right? But this is a way for, this could be some creative ways of, of also uh, incorporating self-care into your, your, your schedule. So one, I, I, I look at emotional, right? So what are the emotional needs of self-care? So I encourage people to do what we call a gratitude journal. Okay, so what is a gratitude journal? So a gratitude journal is when you write down, so this is an activity I do with uh, um, some of my students. I say every morning when you wake up, I want you to say something that you are thankful for about yourself and not something superficial that, oh, I like that I have on nice clothes or that I got a nice purse or, you know, I got a nice car, but something about who you are. I like that I can show empathy to people. I like that I'm caring. I like that, you know, I'm a relational person, right? And the purpose of us doing that is that when you get in those times where you feel down and low and feel like, you know, I just, I just don't know if what I'm doing is right. You go back to that gratitude journal and think about all the positive things that make you who you are, right? And so a lot of times we forget about who we are. We forget about the great things um, uh, uh, that make us who we are. And it could be due to, you know, stress, it could be due to just depression, it could be due to a lot of things, right? But sometimes we have to step back and say, okay, you know what, let me again, just go inward and reflect on, on just the great things that make me who I am, right? Meditation, um, and I tell people all the time, you know, if you're religious, cool, if you're not religious, cool, if you have a, a, a relationship with a higher power, cool, if you don't, cool. But meditation is a good, is a good activity to help you get into the space of being back at one and listening to your body and listening to you know that area around you okay so another thing is physical right so again like i said earlier practicing getting you know enough sleep um practicing eating eating well and exercising these are three different three x are three activities um that you can easily do right now again by getting good sleep having a good diet and getting enough exercise that may cause you to really work on your boundary set, right? So, you know, making sure that within those spaces that you're allowing yourself to get good sleep, you're allowing yourself to eat well, and you're allowing yourself to get a, a good number of exercise uh, events during the week. Thinking about creative ways, right? You know, learn a hobby. You know, for me, it was weird. Um, I went to the dollar store one day while we were in the pandemic and saw this big puzzle that had 500 pieces. And I said, man, I, ain't, I haven't done a puzzle in I don't know how long. And then next thing I know, I started being really into that hobby. It got me out of this negative space, right? It made me, th it made me think of something other than work. It made me think of something other than the, the maybe the, the personal things in my personal life that were going on, right? It allowed me the space to just be by myself and just uh, 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 just manage my stress and my anxiety better, okay? Um, distractions like TV sometimes are good. I don't know about y'all, but I've been binge watching a lot of TV shows on Netflix. It gets me in a good space. You know, again, it distracts me from the work that's always already I know is gonna be there when I get to work on the next day. So these are things that you know you can do with um, um, with some of your your your, your uh, family, some of your friends, some of your coworkers, um, relationships. Again, this is part of the those three P's. You know, um, you know, making sure that you're being um, connected with other people, right? Talking to friends. You know, um, if you feel like you're in a space now that you feel comfortable going out and um, uh, being in different um, uh, work settings or are being with, are meeting up with friends and going out to eat, going out, you know, to dinner or going on walks outside. I encourage people to do that, right? Um, academic. And so what I put for academic is creating uh, communities of, of support at schools. What I mean here is that, you know, we, I, I used the word family because I said, oh, I love being a part of my family. But one of the things that I've even noticed, even just working with Darren, I now have a connection with somebody. I now have somebody I can talk to and say, hey, you know what? 
stress over here at the counseling center. This going, I just, I just need some, some, some additional support, right? Or I need somebody I can talk to or vent to. Okay. So again, connecting with people and using these spaces here at Penn to gather communities together is, is, a, is a great form of self care. Um, we have a spiritual community. So again, if you are connected to a higher power, um, I think that uh, this is great. I would put an asterisk around engaging in activism because sometimes we get so involved in activism that it can also be a stressor. So if there's ways that you can manage that, you know, I definitely encourage that. And then finally, we have therapy, right? And this is where my favorite is individual and group therapy. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like for us, okay? So this is what I tell people all the time. You know, if you feel like, you know, everything that you've been doing, you've been involving self-care in your, in your everyday life, and you just feel like it's just not, not working, or you feel like, you know, your stress is becoming overwhelming, or your depression is making you really low, or you have a history or trauma, whatever, you know, I encourage people to go to, to therapy. And so these are some of the different forms. So we have individual and group therapy. And so some people will say, well, you know, Vincent, I don't know about going to group therapy. I don't want everybody up in my business, right? So I tell people, well, let's talk about the difference. So we all know individual therapy is you and the therapist, and you talk about whatever issue you want to talk about, and you have that, that therapeutic relationship. But with group therapy, a lot of times you have not one, but two facilitators that are giving you feedback. You have other group members that are giving you feedback and you learn how to give feedback to other people. And everybody in the group, all the group members have some form of a shared issue, whether it be anxiety group, it could be a depression group, it could be a trauma group, it could be a recovery group, whatever title of it is, y'all all share the same experience, right? And so you then can say, hey, I'm not the only one in this group struggling with anxiety. You know, Billy and Sam, they're also struggling with anxiety too, and I'm learning from them, right? So those are the difference between individual and group therapy, and they're both really good. Um, next, we have what we call medication management, right? And so I tell people all the time, I don't push pills. A lot of therapists don't push pills because we can't prescribe pills. But what I do know is that in order for everybody to do well, okay, we need you to be at your at your, your starting point, right? And when you're at your starting point, point, you can manage the ups and downs of life. But when you be go below that, which is where the depression is, or above that, which, which is where anxiety is, it's so hard to get back down to your starting point, right? So sometimes medication can help you get to that starting point or, or bring you up to that starting point so you can then manage the ups and downs of life. So will you still be stressed? Absolutely. Will you still be depressed? Absolutely, but you can then manage those, those symptoms better. So then we have family therapy, right? And so this is where maybe it's a family issue. You know, maybe my spouse and I were going through a divorce and, you know, we have children involved and I want to, you know, and that's a, a cause of one of my stressors, right? Maybe my work stress is, is, is really affecting um, my, my, my family dynamic and I want to learn how to manage that, right? So again, Family therapy, individual group therapy, all great forms of self-care, okay? Then we have consultation and campus partnerships. And this is where um, I like to talk about um, EA, the EAP program. And so, you know, as, as the EAP program um, is a great, a great form of giving you that space to just get some things off your chest, whether it be work-related, personal-related, you know, whatever. You know, using some of the different resources here at Penn is great. And then we have outreach programming, which is what I'm doing right now, right? So if you're seeing different opportunities for people to talk about, you know, um, different areas that you may be interested in, where it be anxiety and stress, maybe there's something talking about how to manage your trauma symptoms while you're at work, or, you know, now that we're in uh, uh, coming back, you know, how are you managing your fear around COVID-19, you know, making sure that you're being involved um, in those things are definitely going to be helpful. And so again, I'll move this over here. This is some um, some of the different resources that, uh, for EAP, um, and then uh, the wellness is offering um, different uh, resources around COVID and what that looks like um, for individuals who may be interested in that. And again, so uh, as we end, 
uh, as I end my presentation. Um, if you feel comfortable um, giving me feedback, um, you can always, um, these are the links to go uh, for, the, these are the links to go to for feedback uh, with the workshop name, Navigating Stress While Returning to Work. And my name is Vincent Walford. And um, I just want to end it, end it um, I'll wrap everything up by saying a couple of things. You know, one, um, I do appreciate this time, again, being with my, 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 my new family at Penn um, and talking about something that I think we're all going through, um, which is stress, burnout, and um, the importance of uh, self-care. But I also want to commend everybody for the job that they're doing. You know, for the most part, you know, we are going into systems where everything is new, right? You know, coming back from working virtually or working in person now, navigating masks, you know, navigating uh, vaccines and, and booster shots and those things, that is very, that can be very stressful for a lot of people. Um, so again, just want you to take your time, take some time today just to say, you know what, Vincent, Bobby, Sam, Stephen, whatever your name is, tell yourself the things that you're doing well, continue to support yourself, continue to support each other, and um, we'll make it through the semester and have a, a good winter break. And that's it for me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walford, uh, for giving us those tips. We want to, um, I know that you have an appointment, a hard um, stop at one, but what I want to yeah. do is if we can open the floor to some, um, you know, with people with questions, this is a family event, so we're all going to be, um, you know, open to these, uh, uh, these questions. So uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask them, now is the perfect time to ask. And you can, if you do want to ask a question, all you have to do is just unmute your mic. I gave people a chance to do it. I want, I, I want to, let me start off. I, I actually did want to ask a question and, and I want to thank you for your, um, for you um, with the advice and, and being able to, um, you know, move forward. I want to ask you, when can we determine if something is more um, just uh, temporal or just in the um, just as a situation yeah. or is it something that is long term, meaning is this something I, we need to be concerned with? Are you, are you talking about within yourself? Are you talking about with maybe a colleague or? Well, just just with just with yourself. I mean, if, if a person comes to you. Uh, Dr. Walford, and they said, you know, I've been feeling like this, and, and, and then you can't, you know, how do, how would you be able to deter, determine if it's something that is temporary or something that could be long, and if it is, you know, would you recommend resources for that? Yeah, so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll ask questions around the event, so if I have an individual that says, you know, for the last, you know, maybe two or three weeks, um, I've been feeling stressed out at work, right? So, you know, a lot of times I ask, you know, uh, will identify for me what has kind of led to the stress, right? And so that kind of helps me make a, a better decision on what would be a good intervention um, to go from there. So a lot of times if it's consistent, meaning that this is something that they've been struggling with for a while now, that'll give me a better view of, of maybe this is more of, of, of maybe an anxiety related thing. Um, if it's something that, you know, just been happening on and off for the last two or three weeks or a month, that makes me think more situational. Um, but I also do know that people, people manage stress differently. And so I'll say, well, in the, in the past, how have you managed this incident, right? And so that'll also give me some more uh, data or information. Um, and then finally, I also look at um, what does your support look like? So if somebody tells me that, you know, I'm having all the, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with all the stress, um, and then I go home and I'm dealing with more stress and I don't have the support that I need, that can make me, uh, that can also give me a better view of, of what would be the best inter intervention for them. Okay. We have a question from Pam uh, Gobble. Pam, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes. Okay. And actually, I didn't have a question as much as I wanted to make a comment. Sure. Um, to what you said, and to those of us who have an uh, issue with telling people no. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that is to give to yourself and acknowledge the fact that you're saying yes to yourself and no to someone else. There is a yes in there and that yes is to yourself. And sometimes we have to take that. I agree. You know, it's so funny you say that. I got a, a right right as I was logging on to Zoom, my best friend owns a gym in Houston. And um, he sent me a text where there's a guy that wants to kind of give money um, to his gym. And um, he was saying that, you know, he said, Vincent, my workout time is my, my self-care time. I have 11 minutes left. And he was like, man, I need to give you this money now. I need you to get off the, you know, the treadmill, blah, blah, blah. And he said, Vincent, I can, I can do it. I'm not going to give into that space because when I do that for that 11 minutes, then he's going to call me 30 minutes or I'm going to, you know, continue to not um, be mindful of me or, or actually say, I'm not going to say yes to me. I'm going to say no to me and yes to someone else. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's something that I learned from my um, no is a complete answer book. Absolutely. <laughs> I right, yeah. the young folks say, period. Yeah, <laughs> no, period. <laughs> we have Laura Fox who has her hand up and she would like to ask a question. Hello, Laura. Hi. So, um, well, it's more also like a statement. Um, yeah. One, I do undergrad advising. And so I have, I don't know why my camera, okay, maybe if I move it over. Okay, you can kind of see. So I do undergrad advising in um, the School of Engineering in CIS. So my first thing is when, I knew you were going to be speaking and you were here and I know, and I realized you were new. I appreciate you being here so much because I think it's really needed to have more black males yeah. that are able to help our students, talk to our students and some, because to some degree there's like you were saying, there's this stigma or there's this reluctance to, um, open up or to talk or something's wrong. And a lot of times with our students, we're being reactive because of a situation that has already taken place. Like they have already um, not done as well as their peers academically and things like that. And I know people across campuses as far as the um, confidential confidential resources. And Darren, I always do the AARC also, but like when they need caps, I know that Botsy's there. Yeah. But now I can say, you need to go see Vince, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because, because I think um, that just having someone, like I said, that looks like them, I think that is so important, especially now what's mm -hmm. going on, you know, with everything in um, the world. And the second thing is, um, ain't nothing like an HU homecoming. My daughter graduated. <laughs> HU, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was the main thing. And I also appreciate what you said and for all of us here like coming back to work and the stress level and things like that um but yeah so it's a it's a big virtual hug and a thank you for uh, thank you. coming to pen thank you i i, I want to say something too kind of uh to backdoor what laura said you know um a lot of times you know i've been the only one in a lot of spaces and so the beauty of um you know I feel like of my training was that all of my, uh, before I got went on my internship, all of my externship supervisors were black men. And so what they did was they helped me learn how to navigate that system of being the only one and what it looks like and not putting that pressure of you have to be it or not, you know, blah, 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 but acknowledging it and, set, and accepting it and, and using, because I mean, people don't realize there's a lot of power in this too, right? You know, even though I may be the only one but my voice is loud enough that I can say like, oh no, we don't, that's not, that's not acceptable, or that's inappropriate, or, you know, those type of things. And so, you know, I appreciate Laura, you, you know, you acknowledging that and anything, uh, you know, we can do to help, um, you know, Botsy's here. We also have uh, Yakup, he's, uh, um, he's from uh, Ethiopia um, and he's here too, and he's very connected. And we also have uh, Tiffany Brown. Um, she and I actually went to Howard together. So she's in clinical psych, I'm in the counseling psych. So she's been here for a while too. So we have, we do have a lot of individuals here 
um, you know, I mean, four, but I mean, I've been in spaces where it was just me. So, I mean, four is, is very good. So, you know, but we're here, you know, definitely um, for that support and, you know, yeah. I think Laura, yeah, yeah, yeah. Laura brings up a really good point with regards to, you know, uh, you know, men and, and being able to deal with, uh, you know, a bevy of emotions and, and mm -hmm. stress, anxiety, you know, as someone who, you know, as a therapist, you know, I talk to people, sometimes, you know, you find it hard yourself to say, yeah. wow, you know, I, you know, I may need to talk to somebody about, you know, a particular way I'm feeling or why am I stagnant? And I know it's something and I'm thinking I'm an expert and I'm not. And just being able to have um, you, Dr. Walford and, and, mm -hmm. and other people on campus um, and even our black men, um, our um, men of color here at Penn, um, so we can have that space, so we can be able to talk, um, but specifically in terms of clinical piece, having someone like you available who can help us articulate, I think it's just a beautiful thing. So, yeah, and I, I love doing outreach. I mean, I'm part of the outreach team. When I was, I, I was, I came from Baylor. Um, I graduated from their undergrad, but I, I worked there too for three years, and I was the outreach coordinator there, and so outreach is very important to me here. Um, so, you know, if there's ever anything you know, I can do um, as far as like outreach, you know, definitely let me know. Um, you know, our our caseload is is definitely picking up. And so, you know, the best way I can to manage it, I would, um, you know, but I, I practice self-care too. And I may say, can't do it this week, but if we maybe two weeks out or three weeks out, you know, we can, we can do something, you know, I'm definitely open to stuff like that. This is the time if you have questions. Um, I know that someone mentioned the pandemic. And um, I mean, can you talk about that a little bit more in terms of what we're going through? I know it's stress. We have everyday stress. Yeah. Pandemic yeah. takes it to a different level. You know, you might have somebody not wanting to get on the elevator with you or, yeah. somebody, you know, you know, I've, I've experienced that and I'm pretty sure others have as well. Yeah. How would you, what would you, what recommendations would you give for that? Yeah, you know, one of the things I think is important for us to to really think about when it comes to stress and the pandemic is just to really think about trying to find a new normal. And I think that that is what a lot of people have been struggling with. It's like, OK, I like um, Jacob actually and I were talking the other days that, you know, now that we have to now that we have to see people in person, we have these masks and they're so and I, I, I get hot easily, like I'm sweating now, but I get hot easily. And to sit there with that mask on, I feel like I'm suffocating sometimes. Um, but I think it's good to have a, um, to identify a good support system. Um, I think it's good to, again, continue to engage in things that make you happy. And I think a lot of times in this pandemic, we, you know, we really didn't have a choice, but we stayed inside and, you know, you get tired of just watching TV every day. So finding some creative ways to just be engaged in things that you like, I think it'd be a, a great start. And if it does get continue to get too overwhelming, I do uh, I do encourage uh, therapy. You know, I've I've worked with some students now here at Penn. They're just really coming here to find like what are some ways for me to manage this anxiety I have about sitting in a classroom with forty people who I know may or may not be taking care of themselves. So, you know, just kind of um, challenging some negative thoughts that we have and about the pandemic, about other people. I mean, again, I'm telling y'all this, but I have to tell myself this. I'm one of those people too. You know, I've been going to the gym more, but if I see somebody walking into the gym who um, might not have uh, a mask on, like I'm giving them this dirty look and I'm like, that's, that's not even you. That's not even you, you know? So just kind of working on that and, you know, again, trying to find your new norm. Okay. I think you're muted, Dan, if you're okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just wondering um, if we had any more questions. Uh, and again, you know, the floor is open. You can ask pretty much anything you want. Um, if you need direction, um, if you need any kind of support, uh, this is the place. Um, of course, we offered here at the African American Resource Center. Uh, but as Dr. Walford mentioned, um, there are a number of resources that we have, mm -hmm. um, so it would be great uh, to be able to um, reach out. I know that I'm here at the African American Resource Center. You know, we provide um, a level of support 
um, with regards to any individual, um, whether it's faculty member, staff, um, and student um, who may be uh, feeling um, issues around, um, you know, whether it's you know work related, um, you know, dealing with colleagues and you know just just different uh, stressful informations. Um, so with that being said, again, um, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Walford, for for you know actually participating and wanting to um, help us here. You know, we're in a difficult time um, with the pandemic and everything. Um, we have someone who's thanking you for your wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I say thank you. Topic. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you. And um, we're not going to talk about the Texas thing, OK? We're going to leave. <laughs> so just real quick before I sign off, I want to say thank you again to everybody. But Darren went to OU. I went to Baylor. We all won this weekend. They beat Texas. I can't remember who we beat. But as soon as they lose, I do want you to know, I am I am sending a text message to Darren. And I'm going to brag and brag and brag. I just hope we win too, though. <laughs> it, it, it's OK. It's OK. And then listen, can you put it somewhere in the, um, in the chat? Can you give us your um, email address? Yes. So that way we can get in touch with you if people have questions or concerns or want to follow up. Yes. All right. Thank y'all so much. And I have my client here, so I will talk to y'all later. Have a good one. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So Colleen, um, what do you think? Well, I we still have people on. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's the, that's the idea. I mean, we could talk. And um, you know, we'll open up the floor to ourselves if we have any questions that we want to talk amongst ourselves and you know, kind of process about how things are in the workplace and kind of how we can deal with them and some of those results, I mean, some of those um, recommendations that he gave. Colleen? Oh, are you talking to me or the floor is yes, open to no, everybody I was else? To you, but I was talking to everybody, but I know you wanted to say something. Oh, no, what I wanted to say, uh, oh, hold on. Val made it home. So let me tell her I'm happy that she did. Um, so I guess, I guess. Okay, so I, you know, I really enjoyed him. I really enjoyed his whole presentation. I think that he is very enlightened. He was very enlightening. This was a very enlightening presentation. He's very knowledgeable. I'm so glad that he's joined our family. Uh, uh, and I, I, as I was listening to him, the first thing that one, not, well, not the first thing, but one of the things that came to my mind is that you definitely need to have him for your men of color group because, uh, you know, a mental health stress, all those kind of things is something that men and especially black men have a hard time dealing with as, as well as opening up to, up to somebody else with. And he needs to do this presentation for your men of color group. You definitely need to reach out to him as well. Um, I, I, um, I think I always feel like a lot of times when we have our programs, we're preaching to the choir that we don't reach enough people, especially some of the people who could benefit. Not saying that the people on here uh, did not benefit from it, but um, I think sometimes the people that need it are the ones that shy away. Yeah. And so I wish we could find a, a, another way, a different way to get the message and the messaging and the information out there to a larger uh, constituency. Um, but I, I thought this was really great. I even took notes. Thank you. Thank you. I you even know, had some students out here listening. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, this is a very unique time for us, you know, in American history and I mean, history of, you know, civilization. I know we've had pandemics in the past, but I mean, as far as, you know, this generation, X, you know, gener um, millennials and or, you know, Generation Z, I mean, this is the first time we've dealt with this. So it's, it's been kind of complicated. I mean, you know, I know they've eased some things back up, but as we came back on the workplace, I know I wasn't the first person who felt a little unease when I walked back onto uh, Penn's campus. That was one of my concerns. Um, you know, how are we going to deal with this? What is it going to look like? Who can, you know, when we are confronted with situations around um, COVID, um, whether it's people who have who don't have it, or people who um, rightfully so um, don't have to disclose anything, um, you know, because of HIPAA or because of their own personal belief, and that's fine, you know. But how do we navigate that kind of, you know, you know, a person's um, own personal opinion? I think, um, Pam, you got you have your you have a question? 
uh, a comment, a comment, yes. um, because I'm I'm in two kind of distinct environments, both educational. So I'm in with um, the school district, okay. and I don't know if you all saw the article that they had in the newspaper probably about two weeks ago. We were three weeks in to school, and you actually had the reporting from probably staff from A to Z that is feeling end of the year stress three weeks into the semester because I'm and I'm I'm used to being I spent the last five years in with high school students and now I'm back with kindergarten through second. So it's nonstop put on your mask, put it up over your face, make sure it's over your nose. Um, just in and out of multiple classrooms because I was very resistant to getting the vaccination. The thing that made me get it, and I don't even want to call it the vaccination because it just feels like it's still so unknown, but I got the shot that's supposed to help prevent you from getting super sick if you get COVID. And what made me hasten and go was the fact that I was going to be with such a young population. And on a good day, the last time I was in with them, I had a throat infection and an eye infection. So just the thought of being back with this age group and the constant repetition of having to remind them of something that, you know, it's hard for us. You know, some of us have 60, 70, 50 years of not wearing a mask and doing stuff and whatever was a normal, that trying to retrain your brain and every other part of your fiber to some of this newness um, makes a lot of what he said very real. Like once I come in from work, I'm not particular about wanting to have to go out anywhere else. I'm without a car because of an accident, so I'm on SEPTA. So I got a lot of stuff. I'm on SEPTA. I'm at the school district. I'm traveling up to Cheney once a week. So like all of this additional exposure makes you not want to participate in anything else because you don't want to have to go under the mask or whatever time you can spend at home without a mask on is great. You know, I, it, you know, it's been challenging, I'm guessing, for parents as well with their student, you know, with their kids, you know, sending them back. You know, I posted the, um, if you look in the, um, in the chat, I posted what, what uh, Pam was actually uh, just talking about with regards to the, um, uh, the stress levels and uh, school district um, teachers and staff and how they're feeling burnt out. And we're kind of in October, right? So that's really a legitimate um concern right now and not to include the the other epidemic of, of violence that's on top of that you know so can i say something to that but you you cannot it, it is my firm belief that there's a direct correlation between the amount of violence that we are seeing in our city and across the country and a lot of the stress that has been elevated because of uh, COVID and everything else that we are dealing with in our society because stress manifests itself in so many different ways. And in some people that's already on the edge and now they're pushed over, then sometimes that is suicide and homicide. So I really feel like that a lot of what we're seeing, we already live in a violent city and a violent world, but a lot of what we're seeing now are people that's, that's, that's so stressed that they're pushed over the edge and, 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 and you're seeing a lot of the violence that happens because of that. And we just have to be aware of it. That's right, Raymond said that part. Absolutely, Raymond, absolutely. Thank you, Colleen, I, 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 am, I am aware that there has to be a correlation between COVID and violence and the uptick in violence, especially in, you know, in, in the city of Philadelphia. And the key is, you know, how do we, you know, how do we deal with it? You know, you mentioned, um, Colleen, about, you know, men being able to have a space where they can talk about, you know, issues and things like that. Um, but right now, I think it's more or less not just men. I think it's everybody. We are really, really going through um, some, some difficult periods um, and some stressful periods and being able to reach out and, and have someone that you can, you know, even if it's a, a friend or a colleague, um, as Dr. Walford alluded to, someone that you can talk to, because that's where it starts at, you know, having a conversation and having the, um, being brave enough to come out and say, I want to talk to you uh, because I'm having these feelings, 
or I want to talk with you because I feel a certain way, you know, or I need a better perspective. And I think right. that's what it starts at. So you're right, Colleen. You're absolutely right. right. Um, I, I just want to add one more thing. I just remember also uh, a training that we had when I worked a job for with, with youth. And it talked about that when you see people who feel like that they, they don't have a lot of control over their life, what are some, some of the other manifestations that happen? And again, some of that is violence. And I, and I go back to, you know, a lot of people who felt like they did not want to even engage in this COVID vaccine or like Pam said, this COVID shot, but then they felt like that it was mandated and they were forced to. Now I'm going against the whole grain of everything that I believe that I have to do that. Again, you're taking away a person's control. And, mm -hmm. and, and you have, and people have to sit and live with that decision, whether they think it's the right thing or the wrong thing that I was, I was mandated. I had, I was forced to do that. And that's not a good feeling when you feel like you were forced to do something that is totally uh, not in line with what you were expecting to do, or even want to do. So right. that's another you level of stress that, that adds, you know, because I know where I have been with that. And I know where a lot of people have been with that. And I'm, you know, I have a lot of anger that goes along with that, that I, that some of us will never probably have a place to, 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 to put that, you know, you, mm. you took some more control away from a black person who already doesn't have a lot of control, not in more control. That's a lot to deal with. In addition to um, just to piggyback on something you said, Colleen, about um, sometimes feeling like you're preaching to the choir um, and getting the message out there and the connection that that has with the increased violence. It's like, how do we take this message? It, it, it's like we got to take it to the street, you know, and that's the space also that most of us are very intimidated or afraid to go into. You know, we got to take it into the juvenile justice service center. We got to take it to those that haven't gotten there yet so that we could be preventative with it. How do we take little small samplings of what we said and put it on a little palm card or something and even be able to offer it up because and in, in, a, in a basic language so that more people can can possibly hear it, be exposed. If you need help, this is a basic number. If these are thoughts that you're having, here's a number that you can call because it's it, the, the violence that we are all enduring is enough of a fear to keep you in the house. You know, I try not to let it control me. I live in one of the, you know, I live at 52nd and Market. You right. have some people who won't venture into this area. I raise children in this area and I say that we lived in this space, but they're not of this space, yeah. you know, and if you're allowed yourself to be held hostage is like you're being held hostage by a lot of things, the pandemic, the violence, like where do we get to live our lives? Yeah, thanks for that, Pam. I, I know one of the things, I grew up in the projects in, in Houston, one of the worst projects probably had some of the worst violence out of when you look at projects and violence in the United States. That's where I grew up. That was home. I felt safe there. I didn't feel safe when I moved out. But one of the things that my dad used to always say, when you close that door, you leave that world out there. So you said they're, they're from there, but they're not of there. So I never felt like that that violence and that place where I was in from infected me yeah. or affected me. You know, so that's one of the things that we have to learn. You know, sometimes we can't help where we're from, but we don't have to let that define us. Exactly. Well, you know, I want to thank everyone who participated. Um, and just being here, um, you know, demonstrates how much you really care um, about the work that we do. And we try to put on programs here at the ARC to support you. Um, and if you don't know about the ARC, um, you know, this is a, a good time for you to, um, to find out who we are and the work we do um, and where we're located. And just make sure if you want to um, stop in, our door is always open, okay? Um, and then we have a website, um, www.aarc.upenn.edu. So, you know, if you need to talk, you can always come in. We always have our door open. We appreciate you coming here today and we wanna thank you. And um, that concludes our program. And we want you to have a very nice, thank you so much, Stephen, appreciate it. Thank you so much. I want everyone to have a great day and look forward to our upcoming events on our calendar on the website, okay? Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Looking forward Bye. to another great season with you all.
Thanks, Pam. I'll call you. Yep. All right, please. I'm going to go out to Cheney. I'm going to jump on the bus. I got an hour to talk. Okay. Call you in a second. All right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.